Hello and welcome to Tailoring Recruitment Messages to Your Audience, a webinar for VISTA sponsors and leaders. Although there are differences in their roles, sponsors, supervisors, and leaders are likely all involved in adapting and tailoring recruitment messages for different audiences. This webinar offers strategies for tailoring messages to recruit new AmeriCorps members in the VISTA program. I'm your host, Eric Powell, a training specialist with AmeriCorps VISTA, and I'm pleased to introduce you to our main speaker today, Ryan Fewens Bliss. Ryan is a nonprofit consultant who is one of our national VISTA trainers. In his day job, he leads the Michigan College Access Network and serves as a local elected official on his township council. He's a proud and previous AmeriCorps State and VISTA program manager, and his organization currently hosts more than 100 AmeriCorps members and an AmeriCorps VISTA serving in its headquarters. Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Eric. Really glad to be here to talk with VISTA sponsors and leaders about recruitment messaging today. I'm also delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Kim Lingert. Kim is a program manager with Ending Hunger Corps in Augusta, Maine. I'll give a slightly longer introduction of Kim later as she'll be sharing examples from her work but Kim, we're also glad to have you with us today. Thank you very much, I'm happy to be here. Let's look at what we'll get out of our time together today. We'll start by reviewing the steps of a recruitment plan. Then we'll talk about pulling together the necessary pieces you'll need to have when creating a message. We'll move to assessing opportunities, and then we'll jump into tailoring your message. Finally, we'll talk about the specific roles of sponsors and leaders in marketing. I'm going to very briefly review the VISTA member recruitment process since I anticipate that you all have probably seen this before or some version of it. Step one of the recruitment process is to plan. You should prepare for the entirety of the process before you begin. Get feedback from others and then put that plan in writing. Step two is market where you will advertise and publicize your open positions. You may advertise your project on social media, create promotional materials like flyers or brochures, and track that marketing effort in a database. We're going to focus our time today on this marketing step, specifically around tailoring your message to potential recruits. Step three is to screen. Uh, that's where you'll identify qualified applicants who have applied for your positions. Step four is interview. It's no surprise that in this step, you'll develop and review questions for applicants, coordinate schedules among interviewers and the applicant, and establish a way to elevate applicant interview responses. Step five is select, where you'll choose specific applicants and submit those selection requests to the AmeriCorps Portfolio Manager for final review and, and approval. That's why we say you're selecting applicants and not hiring or approving them. Our final step, step six, is to engage. This is where you'll stay in contact with selected candidates to provide them important information and keep them connected to the project and motivated to serve prior and into their service year. Just a moment ago, Ryan mentioned that out of the six recruitment steps, we're focusing specifically today on the step of marketing. So using the chat, we'd like to hear from you now, and we're asking you to respond to this question. Who are the potential audiences, or maybe you already have audiences you know, but who are the audiences on which you might want to focus your marketing? We're not looking for specific names of people, but for example, the larger audiences on which your project might want to focus its marketing strategies. Before you, before you submit your response in the chat, please do make sure you select everyone from the drop-down menu so that we can all see your responses. Okay, 
I'll read a couple of the responses and then Ryan, I'm gonna get your insight. So I see some programs are focusing on an opening open marketing approach. So applicants at any stage of life, any walks of life are welcome to apply and express interest in their project, which is a wonderful way to do it. Seem nonprofit companies might be a way to market people who have nonprofits and people who are looking for jobs at those nonprofits. Um, and then I see we have recruited a lot of young adults, but also may want to focus on the older age group of people or other aspects of people that may not be in their current marketing strategy. Graduates, second career, people that understand and believe in our mission, which could be at any stage in life. Ryan, are you seeing any themes or commonalities among these? Yeah, it's great to see the diversity of who folks are trying to recruit. I think that really lends itself to our topic today. It's why tailoring a message is so important. One message is not going to reach all of these groups of people. We wanna tailor a message to reach them all, but with specific messaging. So I'm excited to jump in and talk more about this. Thanks everyone for your comments. It's a great start. We'll get into more detail and offer some examples of helping you to tailor your messages as we move on. Before you can begin to hone your recruitment message, you've got to pull the various pieces together that are necessary for the recruitment process. Recruitment, as you know, is not a magical concept that you can pull out of a hat. It's a strategic process that builds upon work you've already done and work you've yet to do. While this might seem maybe a bit intimidating, I actually find it reassuring that all of the work that you've done will be useful in multiple ways. There are three key pieces to pull together as you think about tailoring your message for recruitment. The first piece you'll already have from your AmeriCorps VISTA grant is the VISTA assignment description or VAD uh, for the member position to create an effective recruitment message, especially one that's tailored to a particular audience. You'll want this document that outlines the objectives and the activities for each VISTA member position. The second piece is the service opportunity listing. Each available VISTA member position should be posted on the My AmeriCorps system so interested applicants can easily see the opportunities and apply. This really is the minimal recruitment effort though. I'm rarely successful in recruitment without doing more than just the listing of the position online. That third piece is rare to have right away unless you're a program that's been in operation for a while. That's an outreach and advertising plan. This is the basic guide that outlines how you will bring attention to your open positions. Our focus today will include a bit about this plan, but more so how to build in tailored messaging to the plan. All of these tools talk about, describe, and promote the position, and they contain clear language to capture an individual's attention. So let's start with that most basic tool at our disposal, the VAD. Absolutely critical to successful recruitment and placement and retention is a well-written VAD, specifically crafted for each position for that year of service. It needs to clearly describe the specific activities the member will be expected to perform. The VAD serves as the foundation of the VISTA member's position description. It helps determine what skills are needed, and it informs your recruitment efforts. Brainstorm the personal and professional competencies that match your organizational needs as outlined in the VAD. Imagine potential VISTA members for your program and tailor your messaging toward that ideal. Once you're clear on one, what type of VISTA member is needed for your project, decide whether you can likely recruit them from a local community or maybe a national search or, or maybe both. Seek clarity about what's needed, familiarity with community, and or skills to address needs. Focus on which attributes are needed and which ones you can teach. The VAD is your first opportunity to tailor that message. So let's talk about the service opportunity listing now. Sponsors create a one-page opportunity list listing in eGrants and it appears on the My AmeriCorps site for applicants to apply. Be creative with your information and descriptions what distinguishes your program and responsibilities from all of the others out there? Why should they consider your program? What's in it for them? And have you articulated that in a way to attract your desired applicant? One helpful hint as you prepare the listing is to not use the words help and assist in your VADs and opportunity listings. 
they imply sort of an internship level or non-autonomous responsibilities. If you want to recruit individuals who are excited for the opportunity as part of their career trajectory, don't give the sense that they'll be serving in a small capacity. Another hint is to think about something quick and catchy when coming up with your brief descriptors to grab those applicants' attention. Here's a recent example of a service opportunity listing from a sponsor. Four walls and a roof alone don't make a home. Come revamp our volunteer program so we can recruit 500 volunteers to furnish 5,000 homes next year at the Chicago Furniture Bank. It's brief and it aims to give the potential applicant an idea of what they would do as a VISTA member with the project and tries to pique their interest enough for them to apply. Here's another example provided to us from a sponsor. Like construction projects, we build homes, personal strength, stability, and self-reliance in partnership with families in need. Help us literally raise the roof over a better life. Again, it's very concise language. It's written to appeal to the audience's passion and motivation and hook them to want to learn more. And it talks about impact. Once you've launched your service opportunity listing, be sure to keep it up to date and accurate. If the date for accepting applicants or the start date is passed, be sure to uh, update it. Applicants get often confused by a past start date and assume the position is no longer available. The last tool for us to assemble is an outreach and advertising plan. The more robust and specific your plan, the easier your recruitment efforts will be. Spend some time on the plan now and save some time later. You'll want to identify strategies to reach potential applicants who match the personal and professional competencies that you're seeking, those things we brainstormed earlier. Think about things like non-traditional recruiting efforts. So while recruiting at a university is definitely a tried and true strategy, your organization can explore maybe alternative talent sources like accelerated training programs and community organizations. Examples like this are Dress for Success or Goodwill Industries Career Center, as well as Job Corps. You don't have to start from scratch, which is nice. You will also want to identify community groups and agencies that have a direct contact with your priority groups you're trying to recruit. Networking with them can create awareness and help bring you new recruits, aid you in identifying new places to advertise, assist you in forming partnerships, which is always great, and give you ideas on how to design future activities, especially focused on recruitment and marketing. Messaging is the third aspect of that plan. We're going to drill down on this a bit deeper later in the presentation, uh, talking about messaging and how well to do it. Now I'm going to ask Eric to introduce our guest speaker, Kim, who you heard about earlier. She's going to share some thoughts on these three resources used for recruitment from her experience. Thanks, Ryan. Kim Lingert is a program manager with Ending Hunger Corps, as I mentioned earlier, in the beautiful state of Maine. During her tenure with them, she has introduced communication protocols between federal programs, the state of Maine, food security partners, and program members, which have greatly enhanced partnerships, collaboration, the ability to address challenges, and the strength of the overall program. Specifically regarding recruitment, Kim has revised recruitment and retention processes by introducing social media, new terminology, and even in public presentations. This has led to increased applications for program member positions at her project. So we're so excited to have you here. Kim, take it away. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Our program recruitment outreach and advertising plan is based on research and statistics available through AmeriCorps, especially the video on effective word choices and the paper on housing access, and specific training regarding advertising cultures and communities with an understanding of the specific needs of positions we are recruiting for, which is determined through in-depth site application processes, which includes the interviews and a site visit. For example, we need to know, do the sites require VISTA to have a car or is public transportation available? And what are the benefits connected to the position? Some of our sites provide either housing or a housing allowance, 
And in a state where about half of the residents can't afford housing, that's an important message to convey clearly, as well as the increased employment opportunity. Most of our members were offered positions either with their sites or contacts made during their service with us. I believe strongly also in using the resources around you. Our program coordinator also has a background in business development and marketing. And together we work with our media relations team to achieve the best results and expand the methods of our outreach. We share the materials we develop and our overall campaigns with our sites and request that they share those resources through their networks. A less typical part of our plan is that we continue to nurture our members' ability to recruit new people to our program. So our current members are also a part of our plan and a big part of our marketing. We recruit year round, so members become a resource to talk, to talk about their work, their sites, and their overall experience with applicants. We then determine the best advertising model for the position using written and digital ads and soon video, networking through community partners. In our ads, we emphasize the benefits of the site and Ending Hunger Core, particularly the cohesiveness and collaboration of our cohort. As members are spread across a large area, being connected with others of similar situations and values is important and that we have a policy to provide our members access to multiple professional development opportunities during the service. We've also found that pictures are worth a thousand words. Thus our program coordinator, who is our recruitment specialist, has developed photo story panels for the different sites with current members and their programs featured and an invitation to join us. We share the materials we develop in our overall campaigns with our sites and request that they share those resources through their social networks. Positions are posted on bulletin boards at our sites and partners, and even at some local businesses. Both still and video listings are created and shared on our webpage, LinkedIn, Instagram, Handshake, and other platforms. Recruitment also occurs through colleges college partnerships, plus through community events. And again, all media we develop is shared with our sites, members, and other partners for them to distribute as well. Thanks, Kim. It's clear you really thought about your recruitment, and it's also really clear that if programs haven't identified priority populations in their recruitment, they may be missing opportunities for their message to reach great candidates. One of the ways I like to get into tailoring messaging for the outreach and advertising plan is to do some assessment on my situation. It helps to take a holistic look at the program and to best determine what opportunities exist and what strategy you can use to take advantage of those opportunities. To start assessing the situation so you can tailor your message, grab these three tools. We discussed early, earlier these things, the VAD, the service opportunity listing, and the outreach and advertising plan. Start by reviewing where you've made references to specific skills, experiences, or backgrounds of the person who will best be able to achieve the goals of this program. I like to do that with a highlighter and go through and actually highlight the words. Uh, I also like to write them down on a separate document. Or if I'm working with others in this exercise, we put the information up on a flip chart for us all to work from. So we're pulling those words out. Let's provide some easy guiding questions for you to consider as you determine your situation and look to develop and tailor that message. My first recommended guiding question you should consider is what type of person are you looking for? This is basically having you identify your primary audience. Examples could include, and you mentioned some of these earlier, career changers, Spanish speakers, veterans, community residents. The next question to consider is, does your project have more than one audience when it comes to recruiting members? And why is that a particular audience for your project? Next, I'd consider 
where would these types of people be found? In a library, uh, on the parent-teacher organization, maybe they're retired from teaching. Do you see how we keep drilling the questions down to something very actionable for these uh, for your recruitment? Perhaps we host an information session at the local library, or maybe we attend the PTO meeting and give a presentation. Maybe the school district will send out an email on your behalf to their, re their retired faculty. After deciding where you can find your audience, you might be able to drill this down even further by considering what qualities would be the best applicants have. Where do people with those qualities present themselves? We wanna build engagement with these places into that outreach and advertising plan. So this can be as simple as something like, you're recruiting for a VISTA member focused on literacy issues. What qualities might a good member have to work on a literacy issue? Uh, love of education, maybe a passion for children if we're dealing with child literacy, perhaps an interest in reading as a hobby. The last piece of determining your situation is to see where you've been successful in the past and scale up those efforts in the future. Hopefully you've collected some data annually to know what's working for you if you've had a program for a while. But if you're not, a very simple way of finding what's working is to ask your current cohort of VISTA members, uh, if you have some again, how did they find out about the program? What made them interested? Where did you see the recruitment materials? What helped them determine that they wanted to accept your offer? In my program, we worked this into some of our intake materials. That way we could aggregate the data each year without having to survey our VISTA members over and over. How did you and your current VISTAs get recruited? What stories, feedback, or quotes can you get from them to improve your recruitment uh, of new members? Obviously, these ideas worked, at least partially, so continue to do those things bigger and better. As part of your assessment, I encourage programs to look through their inclusion lens. Not only is this the right and equitable thing to, for us to do, but it's also quite beneficial in terms of opening up new recruitment opportunities. I tend to use three questions to ensure that I'm using my inclusion lens. I imagine there are probably many more you could ask, but these seem to work well to help me and my brain get working and thinking about these topics, especially as someone who is often included in things by default. First, what would prevent someone from serving? Are there physical, mental, geographic, financial aspects of the VAD that would make it hard or completely prevent someone from serving? If so, can we eliminate some of these barriers? And if we can eliminate them, how do we make sure our tailored messaging tells those candidates that they may not be able to fulfill the duties of the position? Now I say that very lightly. This isn't an excuse to infuse bias into your process or purposefully exclude people. That's really the opposite of the intent here. Would someone with different abilities be able to serve in this position? Are there transportation necessities? We talked about that a, a few slides ago that make it hard for someone who doesn't drive to serve in this role. Are there specific background checks other than those that are completed by AmeriCorps that candidates have to be able to pass? These are potential barriers that may prevent folks from serving. Second, who are we not reaching in our current outreach? If I look at my pool of candidates, and see that we're overrepresented in certain populations, that's cause for me to dig in. It could be mostly Caucasian applicant pool or mostly young or mostly female. If that's the case, I wanna figure out what it is about the position or the outreach that's not working for other populations. The strength of your program depends on you having multiple voices at that table. So think about what your program is missing when those vo voices aren't present. Lastly, how can I find and support those with lived experience? The best way to determine how to support a community is to be a part of that community. Who can help your agency serve refugees better? A refugee. Who can help you reach out to veterans? Obviously a veteran. Who will help you connect with particular neighborhoods? Someone who lives in that neighborhood. 
Finding those with lived experience can take extra work, but trust me, it is worth it. Not only is their service richer and often more impactful, it also sends a message to those communities that you don't see them as deficits, that you see them as assets that those communities hold. Asking ourselves those three questions reminds us that oftentimes we aren't purposefully designing our outreach to exclude people, but we may be unable to see our mistakes in our own work. I really recommend that teams work on recruitment efforts rather than a single individual. That's better for sustainability to start with, but it also makes the recruitment efforts richer and stronger. So like I'm a middle-class kid from Northern Michigan Again, I don't come with a lot of experience that would lead me to be a good recruiter in the urban core of Detroit or in a, another state or in another socioeconomic status. So build your team and then encourage them all to look through their inclusion lenses. So I'm really eager to hear from our guest speaker, Kim, again, on what she can tell us about assessing our situation. Thank you, Ryan. Hawking. Our assessment occurs through direct communication with those involved. We also communicate with applicants throughout the process and after they join our cohort. Each new site submits paperwork that is combined with in-person visits, during which we can learn about their programs firsthand and talk with them about their goals and needs. This provides a level of insight that cannot be achieved through a form. We have regular check-ins with our sites during, which we ask for feedback on our processes. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are fundamental to our identity as a state program. By focusing on creating a collaborative work product, we have the benefit of checks and balances in what we put out. This also means that we create more than one single plan. For example, We've developed a print campaign along with our social media campaign. And within the social media campaign, we use different platforms. We also do face-to-face -face campaigns where we work with colleges and community organizations and present to the communities they serve. Further, DEI training is built within all orientations to our program, both for sites and with members to help this be a part of our mission overall. I love this information, Kim and Ryan, that you're providing. This is such great information. And it's actually the perfect segue into a point that we want to get you thinking more specifically about messaging and specifically this aspect of tailoring. So we're going to give you an activity and we'll use the chat again. And if you don't have the chat open, simply select the speech bubble icon at the bottom of the screen. For this scenario, I'm going to read a few high level sentences about a fictional VISTA member placement. I'd love for you to take what Ryan and Kim have shared and tell us in the chat how you might tailor your recruitment strategy outlined in your outreach and advertising plan. This may be skills this person should have or experience that they built or something using our inclusion lens. So here's the story. Every child needs an advocate in their corner, especially if they're in the foster care system. Apply now to serve as an AmeriCorps VISTA with the Clinton County Court Appointed Special Advocates, or the CASA program, and empower passionate volunteers to be the voice for a child who may not be able to speak for themselves. Make a lasting difference for kids in need by recruiting and training caring adults to advise our county judges as they determine the best supports for children experiencing foster care. So again, we're asking you now to tell us how you would tailor this recruitment strategy for the VISTA member position using the chat. You can type a few words or just your ideas, but go ahead and post those in the chat. We'll give you another 30 seconds to submit your responses. And again, we ask you to make sure you submit it to everyone. Thank you.
I know this is a little bit more of a detailed question, and um, but I did see a comment earlier pertaining to this around one way to tailor the tailor this would be if you're looking for someone who has experience, maybe perhaps they didn't go to college, you could add a phrase that talked about your lived experience or the, the amount of time that you've spent in your pre past history on the specific topic. So it's ways you can add different words into it to tailor it enough that it goes to a specific audience, but still broad enough that it could apply to many different people. So definitely, if you have other thoughts, feel free to post them in the chat. Ryan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to see if you have any thoughts or other, other ideas you want to share about this. Yeah, thanks, Eric. The key to this is really picking out some of these keywords and figuring out how you can use them in your recruitment. So things like working with the legal system and working with judges, who are folks around that system that might be great potential VISTA members? Maybe it's a, a potential law school student, or maybe it's a retired lawyer, someone who's been part of the system. Uh, obviously, folks don't have to have that level of detail as a VISTA member, but could help them uh, support that Clinton County CASA program uh, a little bit better. So that's the idea is you, you write a message and you can see who are the types of people, where would these types of people will be, how can I reach out to them? Because again, if we're we're recruiting as in a wide brush, while we can feel like that's better, it actually misses a lot of these particular candidates who don't see themselves in your recruitment. So uh, I'm glad folks took a second and I can see some responses coming in here. These are really great. Uh, it's nice to see the variety of ideas taking this strategy on and, and working to tailor it. Again, thanks for those responses. You're clearly understanding these concepts. Uh, it's obvious that you all are doing tailoring of your messaging uh, in your programs already, which is great. I wanna share three more specific ideas about tailoring your message that will help you as you work to do this in your own projects. We all know that language is powerful, but when you're asking people to give a year of their lives in service to their country, language can make all the difference. You're asking for a big commitment, so you want to help people see themselves in that position as they read the description. The more comfortable and realistic and possible that feels for them as they look over the posting or advertising, the more likely they are to apply to serve. So when I say language, I mean a few different things. One meaning is that you need to use descriptive and action-oriented language. We've discussed this a bit already. Uh, you're trying to motivate someone to make a life decision and to follow through then on applying. Passive and weak language aren't just poor in efficacy, they may even scare candidates away. What words can you use that show these positions are fun and challenging, opportunities for growth, and of course, you need to be honest. We're not trying to dupe people into something that isn't what you describe. Uh, but remember, everyone wants to make a difference, to have an impact on the world. The more language you use that communicates those concepts, the more likely you are to get folks excited to come on board. I was at a VISTA training last week, and I heard a VISTA say, uh, AmeriCorps saved my life. And it was, uh, it was an amazing message. The second meaning of language here is quite literal. What language are you using in your materials? Are you looking to find candidates who speak Spanish? Well, create your materials in Spanish. If you're looking to bring on board someone who has lived experience, that lived experience may include speaking English as a second language. And remember, I'm not mentioning this to you as a way of avoiding these populations, but instead as a way to bring them into your organization and serve uh, your and ultimately their community. If you've ever traveled to another country where you don't normally, uh, or excuse me, you don't primarily speak English or don't primarily speak your language, you'll know how reassuring it is to meet someone that does speak your native language or to read something in your language. You see, you feel seen, you feel valued and included. That's how lots of others will feel when they read your materials in their native language. My final definition for language is about technical jargon. Uh, I've worked in 
nonprofits in the AmeriCorps for over 20 years, and my family still sometimes looks at me as if I have just made dolphin noises when I describe what I do. And it's almost always because I use a bunch of acronyms and jargon that lost them along the way. We're really good at this in our field. So we have to work extra hard to simplify and use mainstream language for the service we do. So instead of saying something like, the VISTA member will build SOPs for ISDs in the creation of EDPs for SPED students in order to meet the needs articulated by the PTO, you might say, the VISTA member will build standard operating procedures for intermediate school districts in the creation of educational development plans for special education students in order to meet the needs articulated by the parent teacher organization. Even that sentence still includes a lot of jargon, but at least you know what the words mean. My spouse does not work in this field, so I'll often test my language that way by asking if my writing is making sense and if they could tell me in their own words what it is I'm trying to say. Language is a key part of tailoring your message and can be easily overlooked. One meaning that, excuse me, one meaning is that you need to use clear, descriptive, and action-oriented language. So again, we've discussed that already. Uh, what words can you show that these positions are fun and challenging opportunities? Again, we mentioned that as well. Uh, the more language that articulates those concepts, the better your recruitment will be. The second meaning of language here we've talked about as well, uh, which language you're using in your material. And then the final again is that technical jargon piece. So on to the next slide here, I wanna highlight some benefits about another way to tailor your message to specific audiences. You're gonna to try to recruit by highlighting particular benefits in your materials. We're on the umbrella slide here. The more you hold up the particular benefits that they like the most, the more you'll grab their attention. For example, if you're trying to recruit retirees to serve in your projects, talking about the education award may not be the best way to sell the opportunity. Most retirees are probably not looking to go back to school and highlighting that benefit may actually send the message that the opportunity is intended for a younger audience. But on the flip side, maybe your intended recruitment population has children or grandchildren that could use the Ed Award. In this case, we'd want to play up the Education Award and its ability, ability to be delegated to certain family members. In the AmeriCorps VISTA program I ran for several years, we placed members on college campuses around the state of Michigan. Many of those campuses offered members free housing when they served since housing on many campuses is an abundant resource. This helped me recruit people that either needed homes or people that couldn't afford housing on the VISTA member living allowance. I often work to recruit young professionals as my VISTA members. When this is the case, I often talk about the networking connections and career supports that we offer. My day job organization, as you heard, is a statewide network. So we have a network of members all over the state of Michigan. If you're looking to connect formally or informally with someone in the state, because that's what job you're searching for after your year of service, I'm your guy. I can help you connect with those folks. I can help VISTA members build their contacts to help them enroll in education or find a job after their year of service. One of my opening offers to my AmeriCorps members is that if they serve that full year in good standing, they can use me as a reference or that I'll write them a recommendation letter. This helps them further their career and is really a benefit of serving in our organization. Picking and choosing certain benefits and when you lead with those particular benefits is another way that we can think about tailoring our message and you can use uh, to your project's benefit. My last example of tailoring your recruitment message is about media. In this case, I'm using that as the plural of medium, not to talk about like the news media. As you assess your situation to determine what types of people you think are best suited for your VISTA member positions, there will most likely be a favored medium to reach that population. This is virtually the same calculation you'd make about recruitment location. I wouldn't recruit at a retirement home for a position that is best suited for people right out of college. 
that group of people are not typically hanging out in retirement homes. You also would not post an advertisement for your position in a newspaper if you were trying to reach recent high school graduates. They're not reading the newspaper. So another good practice is to brainstorm what forms of media are available to you in your recruitment efforts. I recently ran a campaign that was geared at recent high school grads and we placed ads on YouTube, Spotify, and Instagram because that's where those populations are. Often the best recruitment pools are those that are made up of current volunteers and benefactors to your organization. They already know about and value the mission of the organization. You don't have to sell them that. Hopefully your organization has some sort of newsletter that goes out to these people who are already connected. That might be the best medium for that population and that message. So to recap, think about further tailoring your message through language, talking about those AmeriCorps benefits and through different media. Kim, I'd love to hear what you've done in these areas in your own recruitment. Actually, Kim, I'm gonna keep going here if you don't mind. Let's offer a comparison as an example. Uh, on the left side, let's see the text as a draft open uh, VISTA member position. So it reads, Seeking Ending Hunger Core AmeriCorps VISTA. We're looking for an AmeriCorps VISTA member. Our current member writes grants and helps us coordinate after school events. This position includes working in the Allen Day Community Garden as part of Maine's roadmap to end hunger by 2030. If you are interested, visit our website. So that message is fine, but it has some depersonalized, uh, it's been depersonalized rather, and it uses no images and doesn't do a good job of describing much about the role and how important it is to Maine's hunger initiative. Compare that to the image you see on the right, which is the version Kim's Project crafted for Instagram. And the, that Instagram message reads, Meet Carrie, a VISTA member with Ending Hunger Core, serving at the Allen Day Community Garden in Norway, Maine. Carrie's had a busy schedule this season. A typical day for Carrie is spent working behind the scenes of the operation. Most recently, they've spent some time writing grants and helping to coordinate after school programs and events like the pumpkin carving event that the garden hosted. Carrie's work at the Allen Day Community Garden is an invaluable piece in Maine's roadmap to end hunger by 2030. To learn more about how to get involved with AmeriCorps and help reduce food insecurity in Maine through projects like Carrie's, visit the link below. So notice the difference there. It's pretty clear, right? The Instagram message per is personalized the positioning, excuse me, it personalized the position by highlighting uh, a current VISTA, a real person named Carrie, the activities that Carrie is engaged in and some language about how important the VISTA work is. That's an impact language I was talking about. Uh, and that ties it into the bigger plan of the roadmap to end hunger by 2030. The advantage of social media is the ability to use hashtags, which spreads visibly to potential audiences. So now, Kim, if I could pull you in now, I'd love to hear about more tailoring of your messages. Thanks, Ryan. Once we understand the site that we're seeking to place at, our goal is to tailor a message that can that conveys both the site's possibilities and reflects the values and benefits of our program in recruitment. Thus, we emphasize how we value our members in recognition and support of their skills. Specific to our program is the ability to make a visible impact, member value, professional benefits, and the cohesiveness of our cohort. We do this through both word choices and selection of print and photos and soon to be videos in our ads that include the site staff and our current members. So you just saw a sample Instagram post on the previous slide. By having different forms and areas of marketing, we're able to reach different communities with what is most attractive to them. So in this, to improve our presence on social media sites and improve our recruitment, we found that pictures are worth a thousand words. Thus, our program coordinator, who is our recruitment specialist, 
has developed photo story panels for the different sites with current members and their programs featured and an invitation to join us. When recruiting from people who are using the food access resources, we want to be sure that our sites have our recruitment posters hanging in the rooms and the hallways as people go through. If we're looking for a specific skill set from our college age recruitment, we reach out to our connections with college and community partners to allow us to offer in-person or video presentations specifically to those groups. And to increase diversity, our social media campaigns have to reach and attract throughout the world. So we're constantly redeveloping what we put out. We also have to ensure that we are living these values. So DEI training is built within all orientations to our program, both for sites and with members, to help this be a part of our mission overall. We share the materials we develop in our overall campaigns with all of our sites and request that they share those resources throughout their networks. We also share our materials with members and other partners for them to distribute as well. So positions are posted on bulletin boards at our sites and partners, and even at some local businesses. Both still and video listings are created and shared on our webpage, LinkedIn, Instagram, Handshake, and other platforms. Recruitment also occurs through college partnerships plus through community events. Well, this is great. Again, thank you, Kim and Ryan, for those amazing examples and, and things you shared with us. I do want to very briefly take us back to the scenario that we mentioned earlier. So we'll go ahead and display that on the screen. And I'm going to share that scenario with you again. But this time, I'd like you to reference that last section of content that Ryan and Kim just provided, specifically tailoring the message through language, highlighting benefits, and using different media. So here's the message again. Every child needs an advocate in their corner, especially if they're in the foster care system. Apply now to serve as an AmeriCorps VISTA with the Clinton County Court Appointed Special Advocates or CASA program and empower passionate volunteers to be the voice for a child who may not be able to speak for themselves. Make a lasting difference for kids in need by recruiting and training caring adults to advise our county judges as they determine the best supports for children experiencing foster care. We posted it also in the chat so you can see it. And again, we're just asking you to think how you would tailor the message using language, benefits, and media. How would you incorporate and utilize these three concepts to tailor this recruitment message to an audience that perhaps your VISTA project is trying to recruit? And again, once you've written your response, please make sure to send it to everyone, and we'll give you a little bit of time to do this. Thank you for sharing your comments. Um, seeing a lot of thoughts coming in, I'll read a couple and then Ryan again, I'll see if you have any overarching thoughts, but one is using an image. Images work great. A lot of people are visual learners, visual perceivers. I don't know if perceiver is a word, but I'm officially making it a word now. So images of a volunteer working with children or of what the project looks like. Uh, Kim mentioned that in Ending Hunger Core has all of our members sign a photo release, which is great because you definitely want to get their permission before blasting their picture everywhere. These are great ideas and more coming in. Uh, a lot of them relating to images and videos. Ryan, are you seeing other thoughts or anything that stands out to you? Yeah, I think these are great examples of thinking through media uh, as part of your tailored message. We also want to think about language and benefits. So as I was mentioning during this last uh, chat, 
someone who might want to go to law school might be a good uh, VISTA member for this program. Playing up the Ed Award as being able to be used at multiple law schools uh, might be a good way to pull them in. They get real court experience in the uh, with the program, and they also get some ways to pay for their future uh, learning. So lots of great ideas. I really appreciate everybody. Keep them coming here, even though we will move, excuse me, keep them coming because we're going to move on. But I think it's really helpful for you all to see each other's ideas. To wrap up our discussion today, I'd like to draw some distinct lines around the roles of sponsor and VISTA leader. Uh, the stage of recruitment process requires really a lot of effort, but there's some tasks that are more appropriate for sponsor staff to do rather than for VISTA leaders. And as someone who has had multiple VISTA leaders in my project, I can tell you that engaging VISTA leaders in this part of the work can incorporate their unique perspectives and offer additional support. There's a lot of overlap between the sponsor and leader roles when it comes to marketing. However, only the sponsor can create a service opportunity listing in eGrants. If you're the sponsor and would like to learn more about how to create the listing, there's a webinar on the Vista campus titled Crafting a Compelling Service Opportunity Listing. Uh, and you can find it uh, in the Vista member recruitment learning path. You can also find many other resources on recruitment in that learning path. Typical tasks leaders often take on in this step include determining marketing strategies, thinking creatively about the target audiences, and tailoring recruitment messages to attract a variety of potential members. Leaders also often update the marketing plan to make future efforts more effective. Sponsors and leaders can either share or completely own the following tasks. Creating and drafting the listing, which can be done in an editing program like Microsoft Word or Google Docs. Uh, you could actually do that together if you wanted as well. Reviewing and providing feedback on draft marketing messages. Marketing the position on social media or other locations that you determine are the best fit. That really sums up the unique role sponsors and leaders have during the marketing phase of the recruitment process. Next, we're going to check out how well you've been following along today. So we'll go ahead and share a recruitment message with you and ask you to think about the intended audience. And once we do that, then we'll launch a poll on the next slide for you to submit your answer. So here's the recruitment message. Families experiencing poverty need a guide to navigate transitional benefits as they continue moving forward. Apply now to serve as an AmeriCorps VISTA with the Center or MOBC as an acronym. You may have your own experiences with these benefits and can shepherd the way for others. And if you're ready to learn skills in a professional setting, this is the opportunity for you. As an AmeriCorps VISTA member, you'll earn an educational award to further your professional development, as well as a living allowance and unlimited access to our food pantry. If you have experience with transitional benefits and you're ready to begin your next chapter, start here at MOBC. So we posted the message in the chat in case you need to reference it again. And our question for you today is, which audience is our message tailored to? We'll give you a minute or two to respond to the poll on your screen. Again, reference the chat if you need to before submitting your response. And please make sure to hit submit, and then we'll come back to wrap up.
Okay, I'm seeing a few more responses coming in. So we'll give you another maybe 15 seconds or so as you're finishing scanning the chat to look at the message again and thinking about which specific audience does it feel that this message is tailored to? Once you have that answer, again, click on your selection in the poll and then click Submit. And then you'll be ready to go. So another five seconds or so, I'm seeing one or two final responses coming in. And we will go ahead and reveal the best answer. So the best answer for this question is D, someone with lived experience. And that's because this message is looking for someone who knows about transitional benefits. Having a VISTA member with personal experience will make the people they're serving feel heard and understood, which is important because getting these benefits can be a very confusing process. So before we wrap up, I'm gonna give you a handful of next steps, but first I'm gonna pass it over to Ryan with the first next step. I want to point out some resources for further study on this topic before I go. I like to say, never suffer alone. There's always help to be had, both in your fellow VISTA family members or in the resources that we're about to show you. Know that you're probably not struggling on something that someone before you hasn't already struggled with. So let's look at a couple of the resources here. A Guide to Inclusive Recruitment for employers from the Cleveland Charter, excuse me, the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, or CIPD. This is a robust resource, which includes actions to make recruitment more inclusive, role design, and the job advertisement, uh, attracting diverse candidates, applicant process, selection process. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty thorough. Our second resource is actively addressing unconscious bias in recruiting from Harvard Business School. You've probably heard of them. Here you'll find a definition of unconscious bias and strategies to address bias in recruiting. And the last resource I wanna share with you today is Social Media Recruiting, a complete guide with examples from a website called buildin.com. On this site, you'll find seven tangible recruitment strategies to use with social media recruitment campaigns. So explore these recommendations and work with your team to determine how you can adapt and apply them to your project and help you tailor your recruitment messages to your audiences. Those are some amazing resources. And our next step is related to resources on the VISTA campus. We recently added and continue to add new online e-learning courses. And the recent courses were all on member recruitment. They look at planning, messaging, interviewing, and selecting. Each of them has a very unique focus and are intended to help you continue learning and growing on your journey as you try to attract and recruit quality applicants for your project. So definitely take some time to log into the VISTA campus and access the VISTA member recruitment learning path to find those resources. Before you go, we do ask that you complete a very short webinar evaluation. We always love to review your feedback, so please provide us whatever thoughts you have on today's presentation, and thank you in advance. And then the final next step is we encourage you to register for our next webinar for sponsors and leaders. It'll be on Thursday, April 18th, led by my fabulous colleague, Andy King. The registration link is in the chat. And then for today's presentation, I do really want to give a huge shout out to our main presenter, Ryan Fewens Bliss, for sharing us with sharing with us today. I also want to thank Kim Lingert, our guest speaker, for all of her amazing examples. And thank you to our instructional designers, Bethany DeSablon, Abby Stafford, Elizabeth Floyd, as well as our producer, Stephanie Natoli. But most of all, thank you for participating. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you for joining and have a wonderful day.